Greetings, and this presentation is called The Limits of Hamilton's Rule. And Hamilton's Rule is a simple inequality that weights the altruistic act by the relatedness between the donor and the recipient. We discussed this in a separate presentation called What is Hamilton's Rule? In this presentation, our concern is with the limits of Hamilton's rule in understanding social cooperation. And we're going to say that Hamilton's rule has two limits. I'm going to call the first one an outer limit. And this is based on the observation that relatedness declines exponentially as we go out to more and more distant kin. So the way that we can approach this is that for example, my full sibling will be related to me at a 50% chance of sharing a gene that's identical by descent. So we multiply 1, which is my relatedness to myself, by 0.5, and we get 0.5, which is my relatedness to a full sibling. To go to my relatedness to one of my siblings' offsprings, a niece or a nephew, we multiply that 0.5 by 0.5, and we get 0.25. So the odds of sharing a gene that's identical by descent uh, with a niece or a nephew is 0.25. To go out another step, we multiply 0.25 by 0.5, and that gives us 0.125, and that's the level of relatedness to a first cousin. As we keep going out, uh, we multiply 0.125 by 0.5, and now we're down to about 6%. At another step out, we're at about 3%. And yet one more step, we're down below 2%. And one more, we're below 1%, which means at that level of relatedness, which is six steps out, the odds of sharing a gene that's identical by descent are less than 1 in 100. So there's this very rapid exponential decline in relatedness if we think about it in a genealogical fashion and the odds of sharing a gene that's identical by descent. So there's an exponential decline in relatedness and although this decline never actually will reach zero, so as we keep cutting the sum in half, we don't actually reach zero. In mathematics, this is called an asymptote but very quickly we'll be so close to zero that we might as well be at zero. And then we can start speaking of people who aren't that far removed from us as non-kin. Now relatedness matters, uh, lower relatedness. If we go back to our explanation that we used to explain Hamilton's rule. So there we said that a child has a 50% chance of sharing a gene that's identical by descent and a niece a 25% chance, and this means that we could make two nieces equivalent to one daughter. But if we go out and we compare one of our children to a cousin, well now we need four cousins to be equivalent to one daughter. If we go out to what we call a second cousin, well now we need 16 second cousins to be equivalent to one daughter. And if we go out to what we call a third cousin, now we need 64 third cousins to be equivalent to one daughter. And it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to invest and raise 64 third cousins to make up for not having one offspring ourselves. Now when we look at primates then, it appears that nepotism fades beyond that first cousin level. So obviously primates aren't calling other primates first cousins as far as we know. But nepotism will fade beyond that level of relatedness, and it reaches that level mostly in matrilines. And thus, we can conclude that Hamilton's rule is about cooperation among close genetic kin, and indeed it does explain that and why that's so significant in human societies and other animal societies. Secondly, we can look at the inner limits of Hamilton's rule. And this is looking at relatedness increasing in a group. And of course, some, like Chagnon, have suggested that as relatedness goes up, amity, or getting along, will also increase. 
but this seems highly unlikely in comparative perspective at looking at other species. So animal behavioral ecologists point out that this will be the case only if a special circumstance exists, and that special circumstance is where resources are too plentiful for differential benefits to accrue. In other words, there's so much to go around, there's nothing to fight over. So does relatedness equal amity? A behavioral ecologist named Douglas Mock, who has specialized in birds who nest, uh, adamantly argues no, and his book is called More Than Kin and Less Than Kind, The Evolution of Family Conflict. Mock argues that against Hamilton's rule, a powerful counterforce lurks, and this powerful counterforce is limited resources. The outcome of limited resources is what we call sibling rivalry, which of course is quite pronounced in humans, and there's probably an evolutionary history to this. We know that human mothers are capable of having more offspring than they can care for themselves, and they have to get assistance. And Mock's explanation of parent-offspring conflict uh, turns on that. So an earlier paper on this by Robert Tribbers um, stress that parents have different interests than do their offspring. Uh, Mock argues that in many cases, parents produce more offspring than they can support, and those offspring then come into competition with one another to survive. And this is particularly pronounced in species uh, like the great egret, uh, where they have obligate siblicide whenever two or more survive. One chick hatches out earlier than the other, and that elder chick will then peck the younger chick to death. Now, fortunately, humans are not a species where we see obligate siblicide, but we certainly do uh, see sibling rivalry. So why have too many offspring? Why would this evolve as a reproductive strategy? Well, one hypothesis is based on an insurance policy view. So from the parent's perspective, if the elder chick dies by having two eggs, the younger sibling will then hatch and replace that chick that failed to survive. On the other hand, if the elder chick lives, it will simply peck to death and kill its younger sibling. And the result of this is that parents, by following this strategy, uh, should produce more offspring uh, in more breeding seasons. So this increases the direct fitness of the parents, but it comes at the cost of siblicide. Now, another aspect of this is what evolutionary biologists call viscosity. And viscosity is the result of staying at your natal group rather than dispersing and reproduct reproducing with non-kin. And, of course, the result of increasing viscosity is inbreeding increases, and so does relatedness. And there's a downside to this. There's a couple downsides to this. One is called inbreeding depression. And this is the observation that's been measured across a variety of animal species that reproductive fitness goes down as inbreeding goes up. But there's another side to this. And alongside inbreeding depression, we see that rising levels of relatedness in the group result in increased competition among kins. So it's not the case then that inbreeding depression is the only factor. We might also talk about inclusive fitness depression. And this is the result of having only kin around to fight over resources with. So in effect, you're reducing your inclusive fitness as you try to maximize your own direct fitness. Your competitors to survive are your close relatives, and the more inbreeding you have, the closer those relatives you're competing with are. And we could recall here a forgotten rule that Darwin stressed repeatedly, and over and over he writes that it should be remembered that the competition will generally be most severe between those forms which are most nearly related to each other. 
Now, if we look at studies of primate societies for the last couple decades, they've been observing both kin sociality and non-kin sociality in primates, and indeed we see this in humans as well. And here's a conclusion to a recent collection on primate kinship. The editors conclude that although gains in inclusive fitness may be maximized by cooperating with close kin, gains in personal direct fitness are maximized by cooperating with the most competent partners regardless of degree of fitness. And that's because of the payoff in direct fitness is so much greater proportionally than the payoff of inclusive fitness. So we should predict, uh, looking at these limits to Hamilton's rule and Hamilton's rule, that human societies will be a mix of kin and non-kin. And this raises the question, well, how then can we achieve cooperation and even altruism between non-kin? This is our next question. And one theory on this is called reciprocal altruism, which we'll go over in a new presentation. Thank you for listening.